It's good to be together. Uh, I am going to pray now, and this will be, let me just, before I go any further, this will be our last meeting for several weeks. We will meet again on the 12th of August. So um, next week is the 29th. That will be right in the middle of Vacation Bible School. The next week we'll all be recovering, and so we're going to take that week off as well, and then that will be the 5th. But then the 12th of August, we'll begin again uh, right in here. So, um, and we'll have the other tables set up and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the reason why you're having round tables is because the long tables all had to be moved to our craft stations. And so all our craft rooms um, have those long tables already. So this will, these will have to suffice until we, uh, we get back together. But everything should be back to normal in three weeks. Uh, from now when we'll gather back and start the book of Leviticus. So uh, we'll be in Leviticus starting on that week. So today we finish up as the Lord will allow us in the book of Exodus. And so if you would, um, we'll, we'll open with prayer. Before I do that, I, I want to tell you somebody I'm going to pray for. Uh, his name is Jim. Uh, Jim is the father and he's, he's only in his he may be 70 now. I don't, I don't know that he is, but he might be 70. Um, he's the father of my youth pastor from Memphis. And so um, Jim had a, some kind of an episode earlier in the week that resembled a stroke. Um, so it was a, it was a brain bleed. They checked, and he does not have an aneurysm, but he is still in Vanderbilt Hospital, and they are attending. They, they want to watch him for two weeks. And so um, this is a, still a serious time uh, for him. And so if y'all would join me in praying for Jim, uh, just a delightful family and um, uh, just a, a great, uh, just a great fellow. So if y'all would pray with me for Jim. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll ask him to open us up and, uh, and then we'll get going. So Lord, we're grateful to be able to be together today we are excited about Vacation Bible School. It's fun to see all the decorations and all of the uh, activity that goes on in making this ready for the kids this week. And so, Lord, I pray you bless that endeavor. I pray that we would be able to share the gospel with these kids. I pray that uh, you would um, minister and open the hearts and ears and minds of each one of these children so that they'd be ready to hear the gospel. And, Lord, that some would even respond. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with us this morning as we open your word. I pray you guide us through each, each chapter. And uh, Lord, I pray that we'd be more like you when we get finished with this. And Lord, I pray that, uh, uh, that you'd bless Jim. Uh, I ask that you'd minister to him, give him grace today, strengthen him. Lord, I thank you for preserving his life this week. And I, I pray that you would continue to strengthen him and allow him to return to his home soon. So, Lord, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, uh, where's Miss Willine? Is she in here? Or is she working? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Brother Jim, um, this Jim that we're praying for is an Auburn fan. He's, so, uh, he's from North Alabama, and uh, he was uh, on my staff in Memphis. We didn't have any, well, I'm sorry, we did have, we had two University of Tennessee fans on my staff. All of the rest of the staff were divided evenly between Alabama and Auburn, um, which you think is nice, but it's not. They do not like each other at all. And so, um, uh, anyway, there, there was lots and lots of, uh, of uh, strife uh, in, on my staff. And I had to, all through, all through college football season, I had to tell them, y'all need to settle down now. Y'all can be ugly to each other. You can't do that. So. Anyway, yes, ma'am, you have a question? Oh, you just hold Oh, okay, good. I was like, I haven't messed up yet, I promise. Uh, I did mess up last week, and Brother, Brother Larry caught it. I, I told you that one of the reasons why I don't give you lots and lots of reading material from any book is because I didn't want to be accused of plagiarism. I said the word plagiarism, but that's not what I meant to say. What I meant to say is copyright infringement. That's what I meant to say. Um, I'm allowed to... There's a thing called fair use, which means I'm allowed for a course like this to reproduce um, small excerpts for the purpose of us talking about them uh, and, and discussing them as it being further. But I can't, 
I can't give you a whole chapter uh, on those. And so I, I actually didn't print anything this week. So if you're looking for one, you, you won't find one. It's because anything that I would have printed this week, I gave you last week. Um, because, and I just didn't finish last week's thought. So uh, all of this goes together. We're going to finish up the book of Exodus. Uh, again, one of my favorite books in all the Bible. And, uh, and so we're going to be there together. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus 19, I mean, uh, Exodus 32. Exodus 32. Sorry about the shadows. Um, and uh, it'll be okay. So Exodus 32. I'm actually going to start in chapter 31, verse 18, which is the last verse right before it introduces chapter 32, and then I'm going to read uh, an account, about 10 verses, and then uh, and then we'll go from there. So here, here's God's Word. It says this, uh, Exodus 31, 18. When He had finished speaking with Him, that is, when the Lord had finished speaking with Moses upon Mount Sinai, He gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. And so, uh, again, just a reminder, the way that Moses received all of the instruction was twofold. He received all of the instruction from God's mouth. Uh, and that's a weird thing to say because God doesn't really have a mouth in that sense. God is spirit, not, not body like we are, not physical. Uh, but for this, for the... Um, uh, the anthropomorphism, which is the thing that makes him like man, to speak like we would talk about man, um, God spoke from his mouth to Moses' ears. So Moses heard God. He heard God speak all of these things. God led him through all of the testimony. But for the two tablets of the testimony, the two tables with, uh, with one to four, those first four commandments being Godward, and those last six commandments, five to ten, being man, manward or, or uh, uh, community-based, those ten commandments, God actually wrote with His finger. He actually inscribed or engraved onto those two tablets uh, with Him. He actually wrote it. And so that's what Moses has received there in verse number 18. Now, starting in verse number 1 of chapter 32, now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go, to, go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once for your people, whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make you uh, a great nation. And so, uh, obviously, and, and I'm going to say some things that aren't going to be on the notes, because I want you to understand that this event is the um, center event that, that typifies or that illustrates all of the idolatry in all of the Old Testament. So when you understand idolatry, in fact, I would suggest he even goes into the New Testament, especially Romans 1, when Paul talks about idolatrous behavior. But this event, the golden calf on the floor of the wilderness, down uh, underneath the mountain of God, this event is the event that marks off all of the idolatrous um, 
uh, happenings throughout the history of Israel. And I'll tell you why it is, and I'll, and I'll give you some other examples. There's a book um, that I get most of this from, uh, or not most of it, lots of it from, uh, by a guy named, by the name of G.K. Beale. I've given you some other stuff from him, from him, one of his uh, one of his other books. The book that I'm referring to now is called "You Are What You Worship." You are, or you become what you worship, and it's and, and so we're going to see some of this. It's in the um, it, it's in the words themselves, and uh, and we'll go over that in a second. But let me just ask you, what is the number one um, accusation against idols throughout the whole Old Testament. Does anybody know what's said the most about idols? They can't hear and they can't speak. They're deaf and dumb. And so what you see is that these same things, you're going to see this throughout the Old Testament, that the idolaters, the, the people who begin to worship an idolatry, they themselves will become deaf and dumb. Think about Isaiah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, one of the things about uh, Vacation Bible School and the preparations for it is it stirs up a lot of dust. And so I have been here um, breathing in. I haven't been doing the work. Other people have been doing that. But I've been breathing the aftermath of their work, and so if I if I hack up a lung, you'll know I haven't picked up smoking. I've just been breathing in dust. So y'all forgive me for that. But uh, uh, but uh, the the deafness and dumbness throughout the Old Testament. So Isaiah, um, when when God commissions Isaiah, he tells him to go and preach to them. But guess what? They won't do. They won't hear. And so this is just one of those examples. And in fact, in this example, the people making this, uh, this golden calf, um, guess what God calls them? Y'all need to guess. You know, what are, the, what are the children of Israel known for most when God is angry with them? They are a, a stiff-necked people. Well, what else would be stiff-necked? A calf. A calf. So a wild calf that hasn't been broken. And you'll notice that in other places, uh, typically in the book of Hosea and also in the book of Habakkuk, uh, God's people are called a wild heifer. Now that's not an ugly word. I know in the South we use that word as an ugly word. That's not what this means. It means it's, God is likening them to a wild calf that cannot be broken or will not be broken. They've, they've thrown off the yoke of, uh, of God's uh, overlord being their Lord and they've, they've run around like a wild calf. They've kicked up their heels and all that. I mean, just picture a calf. Well, it's not a coincidence that this calf is the picture that they are using as their, as their God. And the, the other part of the truth is true too. When we worship the living God, guess who we become like? We become like Him. We, we become more. In fact, the whole predestination issue in, in Romans 8 says that we are predestined to, be, to become conformed to the image of the Son. Well, who's the, who's the object of our worship? The Son. This is who we're becoming like. This is we're becoming more Christ-like. And so you'll see, I just want you to keep this in mind because idolatry is a theme that runs throughout the whole Old Testament. And we will visit it again and again. This is the very first time that we see it in its fullest. And in fact, this is the, um, uh, this is the biggest moment of idolatry. In the, it's not the only one by, by a long shot, but... All the other ones harken back to this one uh, because here Moses is up on the mountain meeting with God. The people have already said, Lord, we'll do what you say. You're our God. We'll be your people. They've already said we're in this. And now they're saying, we don't know what happened to Moses. He wandered off or something. And so we're going to worship. Uh, we're we're going to, we need, a, we need a God that we can worship. And Aaron was all too quick to 
be a part of it. So God gives Moses the two tablets of testimony, uh, and then the people sin in Moses' absence. I, I mentioned this on Facebook. I know a lot of you are on Facebook, but I was reading a, a book that was not for this, but it said that the two, um, the two chief sins that God's people deal with is unbelief and impatience. Unbelief and impatience. We don't believe that God's going to do it, or we're impatient. We fret over when He's going to do it. Unbelief and impatience. You see both of those wrapped up right here in this uh, in their statement. They say, now when the people saw that Moses delayed, so they're impatient, he's not there, the people assembled about Aaron and said, come make us a God who will go before us. Unbelief. And, and those two things. So just be careful as we look at these things to, to see how they may, um, in, our, in our own fallenness, our own fallen nature, we may tend in the same directions as, as these folks did as well. So the sin of the people, they were either impatient or unbelieving, or both. And so Aaron led the people to worship uh, in, in, a, in a way that broke God's commandment. Now, one of two things happened. Uh, and, and the commentators are um, at odds with one another. I, I'm going to tell you what I believe. But the only reason why I believe it is because it's from Aaron's lips. And it could be that both are happening. So who remembers what the very first commandment was? Is no other gods. No other gods before me. So one God, no other gods before me. Number two, what was the second? No idols. No idols. No graven images. No graven images. Either one or both of these were broken. It's quite possible that the people broke the first, uh, the first command. That is, they raised up another God. They were going after another God. Now, let me just tell you why this is why this is possible. They have just come out of where? Where they worship what? Egyptian gods. That's the culture all around them. Now God has redeemed them from that culture, brought them out of the culture, but they are they still have all the same habits, even though they heard from the Lord and said, We will follow. It's not like they had been practiced. Now, I'm not giving them an excuse because God doesn't give them an excuse. So I'm not giving them a way out. I'm just saying they have fallen back into an old way of life. They've fallen back into the way they used to live. And, and, and by the way, one of the chief of the Egyptian gods is a cow or, or resembles a cow. And so it's quite possible that that's what this is a reflection of. I believe that at least from Aaron's perspective, however, that Aaron broke the second command, which is, thou shalt not make a graven image. Because notice that Aaron said, here's your God, and then he said, tomorrow we will have a feast day to whom? The Lord. And when you see that word, the Lord, recognize that, that he didn't say the Lord, he said Yahweh. He said, tomorrow we will have a feast to Yahweh. So I believe that at least Aaron is breaking the second commandment, not the first. That he has made a graven image of the one true God. So I believe that lots of the Israelites uh, were breaking the first. They were going after a foreign God. I believe that Aaron was breaking the second. He was trying to pacify the people by giving them what they wanted and still directing them to the Lord. So he is guilty of worshiping the right God in the wrong way. And oh my goodness, I could preach that for weeks and weeks and weeks because we see it all around us in our culture. I believe that the Lord has showed us the way that we are supposed to worship Him. And I believe that in lots of ways all around us, people are running after trying to do things the wrong way. Now, I'm going to say something, and I don't mean to offend anyone. I'm going to, I'm going to speak from my own personal conviction. And it's not a conviction that I force on others because it's just, I may be taking it 
In my life, I may be held to a different standard of this, but I am very, very convinced that we have to be careful. Let me say it differently. I am convinced that we have to be very, very careful. That's what I meant to say. I am convinced that we have to be very, very careful when we use things that represent God. So pictures, um, tapestries, banners, those kinds of things. Uh, let me tell you a story uh, about a men's conference that I was in 15 years ago now. I was in the men's conference. I had just gone uh, to pastor at Kirby Woods in Memphis, and this was actually at another men's conference. And the church that was hosting the conference, their choir was going to do a, uh, a, a song, and in that song was going to be the presentation of banners. We have some banners in our in our own sanctuary. We've never used them like I'm about to explain to you, though. At least not in my in my time. And so uh, when they were singing this song, the uh, the banners were coming in, and it was a it was a song about Jesus. And so all these banners were coming in and say, um, "Wonderful and Counselor and Mighty God." You know, you've seen these kinds of things, and people were responding. Well, you know, so it's it's pretty neat. You're you're reminded of the song that's being sung. But there was, a, there was a final banner that came in, and it, it had on it, um, I can't remember what it said. It had something on it. At the top of it was a crown representing the glorified Lord. And when it came in, everybody stood up as if Jesus himself walked in. I have a huge problem with that. Because that's not how God presented. If we're not careful, we as, cre as creatures will raise up other things and worship God in ways that He did not tell us to worship Him. God has chosen a way to mediate Himself to us. Does anybody know that way? Say that again? Through His Word. Now, absolutely, the, the, the Spirit of God does mediate all of this to us. Absolutely. I didn't mean to take away from But that's a person of God, the Spirit. If I were to draw something and put it up here, and we were to treat it like the Spirit, we would be in danger, if not outright over the line, of breaking the second command. We have to be very, very careful. Um, crosses, same thing. Pictures of Jesus, same thing. All of those things are dangerous for God's people. I'm not saying that, again, this is a personal conviction of the extent of the second commandment. All right, so the, the second commandment is clear. Thou shalt not make a graven image. All right? My conviction is that extends to pictures of Jesus. It extends to all kinds of other things. You might not be convicted that way, and I'm not trying to make you convicted that way. That's not my thing. What is the truth is you ought not to make a, a, a golden calf. That's clear. We see that really, really clearly of what it is. I, I want you to know that idolatry is not something that's only Old Testament. There is idolatry all around us all the time. In fact, John Calvin, whether you like him or not, John Calvin said this about our hearts that they are idol factories. That, that our hearts, out of our hearts, if we're not careful, we will make idols and we'll begin to replace God with those things. That's exactly what we see happening here in the, in the wilderness with God's people. They made something to stand in for God. God is spirit. God is truth. And what they did is said, we don't like that. We want something we can see and touch and lead around and control on our own and all those kinds of things. And that's what we see right here. So the people, and, and this is clearly sin. Yes, ma'am. I mean, do you think Aaron thought that the calf, like, was who God was in his mind? Like, yeah. No, I think, you know what I'm saying? He said, when I think about Aaron, so, so Aaron said some really dumb things. And we're going to see those in a second. I think Aaron thought he was helping God out. 
I think Aaron was going to keep the people from rioting, keep the people from open rebellion by appeasing them and buying time for Moses to come down. That's what I think. I think Aaron knows the truth. So I don't think Aaron was confused at all. I think Aaron knew the truth and he was just trying to pacify the people until Moses came back. That's the way it somewhat reads. And the reason where I get that from, y'all, is, is in, uh, in verse 4, he took this from their hand and fashioned with it a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, notice they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh, to the Lord. So I don't think Aaron is confused. I don't think Aaron is, um, is tricked. I think Aaron is scared. I think Aaron is trying, to, is trying to control the situation so that the people don't rebel against him. That's what I think. Yes, ma'am? Um, in the ESV, it says that they said, These are your gods. Oh, Israel. Right. And you, you, read, you read that this is your God. Right. The NAAC. Uh -huh. I think that's so interesting. Yeah. Um, God's, God's, God is Elohim. It's, it's a plural. And so the uh, most of the time, even most of the time when, when we're talking about the one true God, the difference is, is that there's a, uh, the, the Hebrew uses the definite article. So it's the Elohim. Or in, in, in English, the Elohim. Um, so the translators, anytime they run across Elohim, they have to decide whether they're going to translate it God or gods with a little g. And so that's the difference. That's the distinction. Yeah, it's, it, it's possible that the people meant gods and that Aaron meant God. If, if, uh, I, what I see, and, and this is just reading into the text. I don't know I wasn't there, and there's nowhere else that it specifies it. So what I'm telling you is just my interpretation of it, which is possibly wrong. Uh, although, as I say often, I wouldn't believe it if I knew it was wrong. So I, I really think this is true. But it seems like the people are of one mind, and Aaron is of another, and he's playing, maybe playing word games with them, trying to stay on the right side of the line and yet keep them with him. Uh, because when, when he gets found out, he said, I threw in the gold into the fire and out came this calf. And, which is nuts. It's nuts. It's just bananas. I mean, it, it's just not, I mean, it's just crazy. And so uh, it's not what happened. It, it sounds like a three-year-old making an excuse when you catch them doing something they ought not to. And so, and I don't mean, please, I'm not knocking Aaron. He, um, he did sin, but we, we all sin. He, he did make a bad decision, um, but I don't mean to, uh, he, he just said some crazy stuff. And, and I've said crazy stuff too, trying to excuse myself. So, but this was really dumb. So, so uh, um, and then uh, the Lord alerted Moses. So the Lord said, hey, Moses. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, verse 7. Go down at once for your people whom you brought up from your people. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Don't overlook that. Moses, your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. They are stiff-necked. There's that word, they are stiff-necked. Now let, then let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. So the, the Lord tells Moses of their sin, and then Yahweh threatens to destroy the people. I'm going to kill them all, and I'll start again with you. That's what he, that's what he says there. In verse number 10. And so um, he threatened to destroy all of the people. Are there any questions about anything that's happened so far? Well, we're going to go a little bit further, obviously, but uh, anything so far? This, uh, 
This act of rebellion against God comes hot on the heels of God. Uh, just think of what, it, what He's already done for them. He's, he's rescued them from Egypt. He's divided the water so they could cross it. He turned brackish water clean. Uh, he gave them manna, and He brought water out of a rock so they could drink it. And just because it took 40 days for Moses to be on the mountain to hear from the Lord, and by the way, I believe they could still look up and see the, the thunder and the smoke on top of the mountain. I think they can still see that because that's the way we've left them. I mean, that's, that's what it was when God came down to meet with Moses. And so, but even if they couldn't, in 40 days, they had forgotten everything. They, they, they had just they had decided they were going to do it on their own. They were impatient and unbelieving. So that's where we find them. So Moses intercedes. Uh, Moses intercedes with, with God in verse 11. Then Moses entreated the Lord as God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn, turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all of this land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do. To his people. So he uh, he entreats the Lord. Uh, Moses entreats the Lord, begs the Lord, confronts the Lord. Um, those are all words that would go with entreats the Lord. Now, what does what does Moses remind God of? He reminds him of two things. Uh, his people, the covenant with whom? With Abraham. Now that's important. Here's something I want you to see. I didn't say it last week. The, the, the Mosaic Covenant, this covenant that's made at Sinai and then reaffirmed in the book of Deuteronomy with Moses as the, as the uh, mediator of this covenant, this covenant is subordinate, that is, it's underneath the Abrahamic Covenant. The co what I mean is, the, the important covenant is the one that God made with Abraham. That's the promise. I will make your descendants like sands on the seashore. So much so is that promise that in Genesis, I mean in Galatians chapter 3, we're called children of Abraham by faith. We're wrapped into that. In fact, the promises that God made Abraham, he fulfilled in the child of promise. Which is who? Jesus. That's right. Jesus. Uh, now, Isaac was the child of promise to Abraham. But then, in, in the totality of Scripture, in the unfolding of everything, Paul writes in the book of Galatians under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not seeds, as he eats, but seed. That is in Jesus. And so the promise that was given to Abraham is fulfilled ultimately not in Isaac, but in Jesus. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, which is why all the peoples who put their faith in Christ are brought together. There's no Jew or Gentile, uh, barbarian or Greek, male or female. In Christ, there's no difference in the sense that uh, we're separated. Ephesians chapter 2 says that the wall, the barrier of separation between Jew and Greek has been torn down in Christ. Uh, and, and so uh, He Himself is our peace, it says in Ephesians chapter 2. And so uh, the picture is that all of this, this promise made to Abraham, fulfilled ultimately in Jesus, all of the folks who are in Christ become children of Abraham by faith in Christ, which means that we are the recipients of all the promises that were made to Abraham. Does that make sense? So this is, this is the explosion of the Abrahamic covenant through Christ. So this covenant 
is the covenant that God made with Israel. And when God was about to say enough, they've already broken the covenant. That's what, that's what God is saying. They've already broken the covenant. Moses reminds him of the greater covenant. You see what he said? Moses said, you said to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob that their descendants would be multiplied like sands on a seashore. You cannot destroy this people. And so he argues first from the covenant, second, actually the other way around, second by the covenant, first he argues by God's redemption. This is the people you brought out. Ms. Dolly said your people. These are your people which you brought out by a strong arm and an outstretched hand. So he argues by redemption and by promise. Now I just want you to see something and just file this away. I don't have near the time to preach this. All right? But file this away. If the Israelites are guilty of impatience and unbelief, notice what Moses is faithful in. He believes the promise and he's willing to wait for God's fulfillment of it. It's the very opposite of unbelief and impatience. Moses says, Lord, I believe so much so that he held God to God's promise. Which is really what faith is. Now, I don't believe that God was going to change his mind. He was giving Moses an opportunity to demonstrate faith. Moses said, I believe your promise to, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And because of that, on the basis of that promise, you can't destroy this people. You can't start over with me. And so this is what we see God uh, doing for the remainder of Scripture, even till today. He is, he is being true to His promise to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob, even in us, who aren't part, most of us, I guess, aren't part of the lineage of Abraham. Not, not the physical lineage, but by faith in Jesus, we all are participants. We all are brought in to those great promises that God made to Abraham. This is the hope of forever. I mean, like this, this is what our lives are made. When you said yes to Jesus, that's what you're saying yes to, that God is going to save you, not just from your sins, but put you into this family that receives not just the blessings that were promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are a pittance compared to the blessings that we have in Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 says, all the heaven, all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies are ours in Christ. That's pretty incredible. <laughs> I mean, y'all look, if you can't get excited over the promises that God has made to us, I, I, I can't help you. Like, I'm not a good enough um, speaker to be able to get you excited over these promises that we have in Christ. Uh, everything, every promise is ours through Jesus. Um, even those that were ultimately or initially given to Israel, later on, we're going to see how they'll come true in our lives. Um, when Jesus comes back and restores everything, we'll just be kind of like, wow, this is pretty cool. We get to do this. So anyway, you got a hand up? Yeah, and the, uh, you know, his covenant with Abraham didn't really have anything to do with Abraham. No. God, you know, but yeah. the Mosaic covenant obviously did. It was like you had to follow all these rules and all this. But And so he's reminding me, I know they're not following the rules, but you still have to do what you said to Abraham. Yeah, yeah. It so, wasn't dependent on their actions. That's exactly right. So... The covenant that God makes with Israel, this one, the Sinaitic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, it is a dependent covenant. If you do this, then I will do that. So that's the way you see this covenant. And the people failed at it. They failed it. But the covenant that we're talking about with Abraham, and then the new covenant that we have in Christ, that covenant is not based on what we do. It's based on God's promise, where he just said, it's going to happen. <laughs> That's why in, in Hebrews 8 and Jeremiah 32 or 34, wherever it's written, and Ezekiel, where it's written there, he says, no more will you say to your neighbor, know the Lord, for you will already know your, the Lord, and I will write my laws on their hearts. And so this is, the, this is that great transformation. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, 
that's why I'm able to say that this covenant that God makes with at Sinai, this covenant is subordinate to the to the covenant with Abraham. That covenant is solely based on God's word. I will do it. This covenant is given to the people that said, if you do this, then I will do this, and 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 so on. So it's a it's a different kind of a covenant. Thank you for show, sharing that. It seems like he's a little bit uh, concerned about God's reputation to the Egyptians. Yes. Yes, he is. So God's glory is um, is foremost in his mind. He didn't want anybody to be able to say God rescued them just to let them go. Which, which, by the way, God doesn't do that. God doesn't rescue us and then lets us go. Um, I, I just I don't have time for that either. But just know that that uh, what God does, He does well. He does all things well. He does it completely. Yes, sir. So how do you talk to somebody that says, "Well, see, there, God doesn't know everything. He had to be convinced to." Yeah, I, I would say that they're just dumb. <laughs> so, so the Bible clearly says. I don't mean argue, but yeah, yeah. The, the, the Bible clearly says in other places that God is not like a man where He changes His mind. We have no place where where God shifts um, His course of action. He does. We we have in several places where He relents, where He backs off, um, where He goes, and so. In this case, I would argue that, that this, that's why I said what I did about that this was, this was an opportunity for Moses to demonstrate faith, not a changing of God's, God's mind or heart. Um, the same thing happened earlier with, with Moses himself and his wife. When, they were on, when Moses is on his way to Egypt and uh, God stops him and, and strikes him and, and getting ready to kill him, and, and Zipporah uh, circumcises their son, and it allows Moses, God relents again. I would suggest that God was never going to, to, to do it, that it was an opportunity in both those places, an opportunity to respond by faith. Yes, ma'am. God manipulated their actions to start with. Yeah, yeah. God does stuff that we're not really comfortable with. Um, he, uh, he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, and and so we're just not really comfortable in a lot of ways. But let me just remind us that God is God. <laughs> you know, I don't know how else to say it. He's just God. Um, there are lots of people though who would argue that God is learning and God is changing and those kind of things. But the the bulk of Scripture attests to the opposite. That that's not true. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because these these things like this are always hypothetical. Uh, you could say, well, God was about to, but he, but he didn't. You see, so it's a hypothetical um, situation. Uh, so I always, it, God doesn't ever stop what he's doing. I, I think he has different reasons for doing them those ways. But he does, he's never, like, he, he never said, oh, I'm sorry, let me put it back. He didn't do that. He, he just carries us through. So, yes, sir. He did the same thing with Isaac. I think he, he was just testing your faith. He knew what he was going to do. He, yeah, he was yeah. Like it's not going to be. That's, that's right. right. Yeah, for, for Isaac specifically, because it says it, uh, and, and, and even later in Scripture, he says, Never did it enter my mind for human sacrifice. God, God says that clearly in Scripture. So, you would have to take the, the balance of Scripture. And apply so the way that we read scripture is we take the whole of it to understand the parts of it, and we take the parts of it to understand the whole of it. So in all, it's, it's this constant movement from you know we we say well you couldn't see the forest for the trees, or you couldn't see the trees for the forest. We say it both ways. It, it, when we when we wrestle with who God is and His personality and His character. We have to do both. We have to see the trees. In this case, it says it clearly. And then we have to see the, the whole forest and then back again. It's this constant movement from, from all to little. It's why we need to know God's Word all the way through and not just our favorite parts of it. We have, because as we know all of it, 
we can understand the parts of it, and as we understand the parts of it, we can know all of it. If that makes sense. Yes, ma'am. I have to argue that God didn't go back on what He said either. I mean, He didn't allow those Israelites to go into the promised land. Just like with um, whenever he said that he was going to um, destroy the Ninevites, he did destroy the Ninevites, but it was later because they repented. Right. You know, I mean, sometimes it just it takes, takes a while. It, it takes a while. You know, he's yeah, that's right. It, you know, that's and, right. Yeah, everybody that everybody that he that he held accountable mm -hmm. for this, except for two, except for um, Joshua, Joshua and, and Joshua. Caleb. Everybody and Joshua was halfway up the mountain. Remember, we're going to see that in just a second. Um, Joshua was not even down there with them. Presumably, Caleb is, but uh, all of those that he said he was going to destroy eventually, they didn't make it. But not for this sin. It was for the next one, the unbelief again, the unbelief again, and then the impatience again. I hate to draw up this, but notice God said, you know, oh, we can't do it. They're so big, we can't go in. This is like six months later from now, because <laughs> we're not going to get there today. But, oh, we can't, they're so big. And uh, and, and God says, all right, then you're going to die here. And I'm like, oh, no, we'll go right now. And, and God said, nope, you're not going right now. And so you see it again and again. It's just the it's kind of the heart of our unbelief and impatience is, is this. So that's a good word. All right, we need to keep going. Hold on. So Moses entreats the Lord, and then... Uh, and then Moses goes down and sees for himself. Uh, so actually, so the Lord had changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people in 14. 15, then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. You think it's important that we know that God wrote this? <laughs> and this is like the third time that he tells us that this is what God did with his finger. So it's important. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a sound of war in the camp. But he said, it's not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. So this may just be my understanding of it or my heart. Uh, and maybe it just reveals more about me than about them. But I think they're probably all drunk. That's, that's what I think. I think that they have made, uh, because it said they, they sat down to eat and then they rose up to play. And, and I think that they're not just drunk, but I think they're doing stuff that isn't right. So I think that breaking the first and second command caused them to break lots of the other commands too. If you understand kind of my drift. Um, hold on for a second. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, that's what we see. And what you're going to see in a second is that God takes care of them in a way that it shows that kind of, they probably were drunk. Moses sees for himself. So he goes down and he sees for himself. Came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which, which they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. There. Um, my mom used to say this to me, eat it or wear it. <laughs> uh, that was when I would say I'm not going to eat something that I was at the table. Eat it or wear it. Now, I never wore it, I don't think. But that's the sentiment that Moses is giving the people about, you know, you have messed up. You're now going to have to consume your issues. Um, I, I will not... Well, I was doing some research and I ran across an article that I would not share with you and I won't even say it's it's a title. It's just not appropriate for all of this. But basically it has to do with what you drink, what happens after you drink water and what they were doing to the idol later on. And so it's the idea of it passing through that they're getting rid of this idol. It's gone. Um, if, if those of you didn't get that, I'll tell you later if you come up and ask me. But, uh, <laughs> but it was a fairly graphic demonstration of what Moses made them do to this idol 
at the bottom of it. And I don't know, you know, you wonder, did God put that in his mind or did he did just have enough of the people and he did it himself? But God doesn't scold him for it. There are times when God scolds Moses, but he doesn't scold him here. But this isn't the worst thing that he does yet. So Moses responds. Uh, Aaron says some dumb things. Uh, for they said to me, verse 23, <laughs> no, verse 22, do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself that they are prone to evil. You know these people. <laughs> then he says, for they said to me, make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. And they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> so this statement is why I believe that Aaron was trying to play both sides. Is because he said, you know the people. And I think by him saying that, he was saying, I'm scared of them. I was scared of them, and so I did what they asked, and, and this is what happened. I, I'm, not, I'm not defending Aaron, ex, but, but I'm not, I don't want to knock him down any worse than we need to either. I really think he was, in his own humanness, felt caught between a rock and a hard place. He, he, felt, he felt like the people were going to revolt if he didn't do something to hold them together, and I think that's probably what it is. Now, a sin. It was sin from start to finish with Aaron. So I don't mean to make light of this, and I'm just trying to understand kind of what he was thinking when he did some of this. Because he says some really goofy things here. I mean, taken out of context, you're like, who would say that? That's just dumb. But he was probably really anxious over the situation. And, uh, and so Mo Aaron says some dumb things. Moses and the Levites purify the camp. So after they ground up, after he ground up the idol, made everybody drink it, then, now Moses saw the people were out of control. That's why I think they were drunk. They were out of control. I think they were in some kind of ecstatic frenzy against, um, uh, against God. And by the way, this is why, so, and I thought I was going to be quick, done quick today, but I'm, I see I'm not. Um, this is why drunkenness is forbidden by God. Because drunkenness is a part of idol worship. It's a part of stepping out from underneath the leadership of the Lord. If you read about it in Ephesians 5, it says, Do not be drunk with wine, but filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the the idea is, is that in, in idolatry, so I'm going to use something else. Think of, the, think of some of the practices of some Native Americans with using peyote and other things in order to achieve a spiritual condition. That's not just Native Americans. That is the heart of idolatry worldwide. To go under the influence of something else in order to achieve some kind of a spiritual thing. The hippies redid it with LSD in the 60s. They, that was the purpose of LSD. Take it so that, and I, I should have spoken pejoratively of hippies, but that Tom Hayden from University of Michigan and all of those guys that, that pioneered and advocated for LSD, which were part of the hippie movement, those guys, that's what they were, that's what they were advocating was some kind of outside the body experience so that they could, they could worship. And so this is why hallucinogenic drugs, alcohol to an extreme, all of those kinds of things are forbidden by the Lord because, because of what it does in our worship. So Moses sees these folks, uh, Moses sees these folks out of control, verse 25, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to them, um, to him. He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Every man of you put his sword upon his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Now, 
there's a couple things that I want you to see. First, I don't think that every Israelite in the whole camp was sinning against God. Because only 3,000 were killed that day. Uh, second, I think it's possible that there were some who saw it happen and repented and ran away. So I think that probably happened too. But those who were so intoxicated, at least in the spirit of the idolatry, or possibly truly intoxicated through the imbibing of other spirits, um, one way or the other, they did not see what was coming and they were killed there from gate to gate as he went through, as they went through the camp. And that was the penalty for their sin against God for this idolatry. Does that make sense? Everybody see that? I mean, and this is not the only time that this happens. It'll happen again and again. It happens in Numbers on a, on, in, in the book of Numbers on several occasions where the people who are disobeying the Lord are, are struck dead either through the hand of God or through the hand of man through, at the command of God. So that's what we have here. Uh, let me remind us, because we live in the age that we live, Sometimes we think that sin is okay. That there are lesser sins. That, oh, it's just a little sin. But recognize that sin always means death. Always means death. If you belong to Jesus, the death that you've earned has already been taken by Jesus. But it meant His death for us. It's why His sacrifice is so incredible he didn't deserve it. We deserve it. Like, I still deserve it. But Jesus stepped into my place and took it for me. It's not that I don't deserve it now. It's just that one greater than I stepped into my place and bore that sin debt, was buried and rose again, triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. The way that I know that my sin, which are many, and the way that I know that my sins, which are egregious, are forgiven is because Jesus was raised from the dead. And so my hope is not in my ability not to sin. My hope is not that the sins that I've committed are lesser than other people's. My hope is the fact that my sin has already been paid for by Jesus. That's the gospel. So whenever you see something like this, don't think, don't shrink back in horror from the activity that God called Moses and the Levites to do as if, oh, that's a terrible thing. Shrink back in horror from the sin which caused it. That's what we ought to be doing. We ought to hate sin. We ought to hate our own sin. We ought to hate the sins of others. We ought to hate the sins of people past. We ought to hate the sins of people future. Because we belong to God, we ought to hate sin because every single sin is against God. So that's the danger or the, or the extent of sin. So, um, he broke the tablets. Moses, Moses loses the school. He responds. He breaks the tablets. He destroys the idol. He makes Israel drink the idol's power. Um, he commands the Levites to purify the camp. And then in verse number 30, he again intercedes. On the next day, Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I am going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people have committed a great sin, and they have made a God of gold for themselves. But now if you will, forgive their sin. And if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. The Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But go now, lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Then the Lord smote the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. This is what Jessica was just talking about. That, that God did not just overlook their sin, but He did not destroy them all and start over again. He both remembered His covenant, but then He also said, I will punish those who have sinned. And by the way, this is the way it goes. Moses is not able to stand in the gap for the people. He cannot, although he wanted to. Blot me out if you're going to blot them out. And the Lord said, nope, the ones who have sinned, that's who I'm going to hold accountable. 
Paul did the same thing in Romans, Romans chapter 9. Oh, if only I could be accursed on behalf of my countrymen. If I could be the one that would be sent to hell so that everybody else could. There's only one problem. Paul couldn't do it. Moses couldn't do it. You and I can't do it. But there is one who did. There is one who did. And I just want you to know that that's why Moses couldn't do it. That's why you can't do it. And that's why uh, Paul couldn't do it. It's because the one who did deserves all honor and glory because he did. He could and he did. And that, really, that's the story of all of this book, is that he did. He has rescued us from our sins because he's able. So, <clears throat> Yahweh then threatens to result with all his presence. He tells them to go on. This is in chapters 33 and 34. Uh, those first 11 verses of 33, I don't have time to read them. He said, you go on. And Moses is like, Lord, we're not going anywhere if you don't go with us. Which is exactly the right answer. And God, God accepts that answer. Moses again intercedes for the people. God promises then his presence. I will, sorry, I will be with you. That's the promise. And by the way, that's our promise as well. And so um, all of this, uh, the people have, have acted in repentance. And God promises that they will, uh, that they will be there um, and he goes on, the Lord shows up. So Moses not only says, Lord, I don't want to go, but I want to see your glory. I want to see you. And so the Lord takes him and hides him. We have that great old hymn that we sing. Um, he hideth me by the cleft of the rock uh, and, and shelters me there with his hand. That comes exactly from this. This is what God says to Moses. Moses, I'm going to hide you. I'll shelter you, and then I'll pass by. I'll let you see the hind parts or the backside of my glory. And so the Lord shows up. He protects Moses in it. He instructs Moses in it, tells him what he needs to do. This is the retelling of all of, this, of the covenant. Remember that original covenant was, was shattered there, and he tells it to him again. He tells it to him again, gives it back to him, and... Then he announces his arrival. This may be the most, uh, the highest point of the whole Old Testament. Uh, this is not me saying it. This is just what people um, see as what may be the... Remember, the, the whole of the Bible is meant to reveal God and His ways to us. That's what the Bible is for. We know God, not because we have a picture. See what I said earlier. We don't have a picture. We know Him because of His Word. He's revealed himself in his word. And this part may be the highest part of, of all of that, where he comes out and he says, the Lord, the Lord. And, uh, and so we have that, um, uh, we have that given where, where he introduces himself to the Lord, or, or introduces himself to Moses and, and calls out, he says, uh, I, will, uh, I will forgive their iniquities, but I'll also not not pass over any sin, he says. And that's we have that. And we see that throughout Scripture. We're reminded of that being who the Lord is. Um, great and mighty, this, this Lord. So that's what we see. Uh, he restates and renews his covenant with the people. And so after, he, after Moses intercedes, God reminds him again, you can go down. And so he goes back and... He re-emphasizes everything that the Lord has. The Sabbath is re-emphasized. We see that in chapter 35. And then the, the people are included in the process. The tabernacle is built. Before, last week we looked at the tabernacle. Uh, I talked about all its furniture and all that. But that was the way God told them to build it. They hadn't built it yet. And so now they're building it. Now they're going down and they're building it. The people are included. The workers are called. Anybody who can work, y'all come on. And they come and do it. Anybody that wants to give, come out and give. And so they give their stuff. And in fact, they gave so much stuff. This, they, this is how you know that they weren't Baptists. <laughs> they gave so much stuff that Moses had to say, all right, that's enough. Stop giving. Stop giving. Now, I have never been. No, that's not true. That's not true. Um, I celebrated this at Kirby. When I got to Kirby, we were a little bit over uh, a million.
million dollars in debt. We we're, were a million or two million in debt. They had just built the building and they'd been servicing it, uh, and they'd been paying it down. But when I got there, I really felt like the Lord was calling us to get rid of the debt and never go back into debt. That debt was not a good thing for a church, and so let's move on. So we did. We uh, I got there in September of 2008, and in about, I think, January of 2010, although it may have been 11, I think it was 10, um, in a, so in about a year and a half, we paid off the, we paid off the debt. And on that day, um, we came and we burned the note, uh, much to the chagrin of our fire marshal. We, uh, <laughs> we lit that thing up, and in fact, I had called back uh, Bob Pittman, who was the pastor, when they entered into the building progress, I let him do it since it was his vision, his his thing. I let him burn it. But afterwards, I was able to stand up and say, "Stop giving to the stop giving. You've given enough. We've done." And that's what they do right here. You've given enough. Stop. We have enough. And that is a great thing for God's people to respond in that way and and to give it. Um, there is coming a day, I don't want to give away too much, uh, our, our chairwoman of finance committee is here, and I don't want to uh, steal too much of her thunder, but there is coming a day soon where we will all be able to say together, stop giving to the Windows Fund. <laughs> because we're about to replace all the windows, the rest of the windows of that building that are messed up, and, uh, and we're about to pay it in one or two checks out of a checking account, and so we don't need to give to that anymore, which is a great blessing. Uh, and so that's what we see right here. So the tabernacle is completed. They get it finished, and when they get it finished, guess what happens? They dedicate it to the Lord, and guess who shows up? The presence of the Lord. The smoke fills the tabernacle. Last week I told you that the smoke was on top of the mountain. Now we have the smoke filling the tabernacle, which is the, the, the blessing of God's presence right there. And so the Lord blessed the work with His presence. And that's the end of the book of Exodus. That's where we end it, is with the Lord showing up. What are your questions about the book of Exodus? Now next time when we come, we'll be in the book of Leviticus, we will go... A little bit more quickly, and probably only two weeks we'll spend in Leviticus. Um, the foundation, as it were, has been laid. We've seen all of the pertinent uh, covenants made. If you, um, if you're counting them, and I, I'm not suggesting you do, but if you're counting them, we've seen a covenant made with Adam. We've seen a covenant made with Noah. We've seen a covenant made with Abraham. And we've seen a covenant made with the people of Israel through Moses. And so those are the covenants that we've seen. Uh, and so most of those, we're, we've kind of wrapped it up. The next big covenant comes with David. And so that's not for some time. We'll get there when that comes. So the book of Leviticus is next. Any questions about Genesis or Exodus? Has it been fun? Have y'all enjoyed this? All right, good. Uh, I, again, I... I could go forever in the book of Exodus. I had to force myself to stop. Um, but, uh, but I have. I've stopped. And so next it would be in Leviticus. The high point in Leviticus is chapter 14, the Day of Atonement. Um, but we'll look at some other things on the way there. We'll probably spend uh, uh, one day with the rest of the book and then one day on the Day of Atonement and, uh, and then go into the book of Numbers, which is the book of Rebellion. Numbers is all about rebellion, and so we'll see that in several cases. Yes, ma'am? I see that hand. Okay, so yeah, I've, I've missed a couple weeks. So I don't know if y'all talked about this, but where where, where were they in the food situation then? If they're only eating manna and a few birds that occasionally drop from the sky. Uh-huh, that's true. Where Where's the alcohol and the stuff to get, where's all that coming from? Um, it would be that they would have brought it with them from Egypt. If, if that's the case. They're still close enough for that to happen. Okay. Close enough in time. The Bible doesn't say, though. There's not, there's not a specific statement of where that food is. We do know that God is bringing them food through manna and the birds, and that won't stop until they get into the promised land. But it's possible that, because they were carrying all the other stuff that they brought out, it's, 
it's possible that they brought alcohol with them when they brought all the gold and all the silver and all the clothes and all the other stuff. Gotcha. It's not, I mean, it's, it, but you're right, it's not said, it's not stated clearly. Gotcha. And I don't think they've grown grapes in the desert, so I don't think that's, I don't think that's happened either. Yes, sir, Brother James? Yes, I was thinking, the bulls been up for 40, 40 days. Do you not think God had an idea what they had brought out of Egypt with the alcohol and everything, and it would test on the people? See how what they really think or being brought out. Oh sure, yeah, absolutely. Nothing catches God by surprise. So absolutely, I believe that the time was intentional. Yes. Yeah, I think it was built in. Um, remember what God is doing. I I, I want to finish with this, but remember what God is up to. God is declaring His name. That is, He's He's drawing attention to the glory of His name and the glory of His person. He is setting aside a people for Himself. Which, which involves purification, involves faith, involves testing, all of those things. And then third, he is exalting the Lamb. So, so God gives them the law, the Ten Commandments, this moral law that's absolute, knowing that they cannot keep it. That they're not going to be able to. They're going to sin against Him. This was not a setup in the sense of... of uh, Oh, I thought they could do it and they didn't do it. Those rascals. That wasn't, that's not the point. God is moving towards something. He is doing this all along. So every stage, He's moving them towards something. And that something is really a someone. And it's Jesus. I believe the whole Bible is read through the prism of the Lord Jesus. And so absolutely, I, all of this is set up so that Jesus comes along. He says, I didn't come along to do away with the law, but I came to... Fulfill it. So Jesus steps in, fulfills the law, says, says to Adam, as it were, Adam, this is what you were supposed to do. Says to the people of Israel, as it were, this is what you were supposed to do. Says to you and me, this is what you were supposed to do. And then he does it. And then he says, but because y'all couldn't do it, watch what I do. I'll pay for it for you. I'm going to step into your place and pay your sin debt. They took him off the cross and buried him. He comes back from the dead and he says, now you're my people. Now it's all done. You can, you can walk with me. It, it is absolutely finished. You can walk with me. I'll send my spirit to be in you. The laws will be written on your hearts. No longer do we have, like, I mean, I'm not opposed to this, but no longer do we have the, like, the, the law written up on the wall. I mean, if you want to put the Ten Commandments up, that's cool. But that's, that's not what, it's not external to us anymore. We don't have to conform to that because He's doing the work through us on the inside. That's what the Spirit does. You know, um, so, yeah, absolutely, my brother. I, that's absolutely true. God is moving us toward something, and it's toward the Lord Jesus. Anything else? All right, God bless you. Remember, two weeks. The next two weeks are off. The 29th, we'll be here for Vacation Bible School. The 5th, we won't be, we won't be doing anything. The 12th is our next time here. So I will see you here then. God bless you. Take care.